This sheet dating back to the 1800s was handmade from flax, spun and woven by hand by Janet Fenwick, a cottage linen worker in the village of Bankfoot in Scotland. It was one of the many items gathered up by Janet, her husband John, and their 19-year-old daughter Mary when they boarded the ship William Miles. The long sea voyage was the beginning of a new chapter in the lives of the Fenwick family. And for Mary, it was the beginning of a new life in Australia. When they set sail on October 10, 1854, also aboard that ship was a young man by the name of William Grigger. William befriended the Fenwicks, and in time, romance between young Mary and William blossomed. When he became good friends with her dad, so uh, we don't know if he was actually boyfriend pretty well by then, but, but he was certainly good friends with the dad, so he was making the right moves. After docking at Queen's Wharf in Brisbane, William began working in the timber industry and Mary found work as a governess in Newstead House, Brisbane, for Captain John Wickham, a man who had ambitious plans. He was going to be, well, he thought he might have been the new governor of Queensland, but he didn't get that job. So he decided to take his family, his new family, back to uh, the UK. Mary parted with her family and William and accompanied her employers on the long sea voyage back to England in 1860. During the voyage, Mary assisted with the birth of the Wickham's second child. But when the family arrived in England, they informed her they would not be returning to Australia. Mary, deciding not to remain in England, found employment on another ship and worked her way home alone. She said, no, she wasn't going to stay. Her parents and her boyfriend were in, in Australia. She was coming back. So to find somebody to be governess for all the way back to Australia and then get back here again <laughs> without any other family around, I think she did pretty well. A bit braver than I'd be. Mary took a ship called the Othona, which uh, we think, from the records that we've looked at, arrived in Melbourne. And then from Melbourne, she made her way overland back to uh, Queensland and to Moreton Bay. Mary decided that this was the place for her, so she came back on her own, which in those days was a very brave thing to do for a woman of that age, to travel back on a ship, which didn't take just a few days, it took weeks to get here. Mary must have been a pretty feisty lady. After her arrival back in Queensland, she became governess on Durrander Station, near the town of Woodford. She also reunited with William, and in August 1863, Mary Fenwick and William Grigger were married at the Presbyterian Church in Eagle Farm, Brisbane. Soon after, they made their way north from Brisbane to an area known as Malula, which today is called Malulabar, to work in the timber industry with other Scottish settlers. It was during this time Mary gave birth to the first three of their ten children, John, Janet and William Andrew. In October 1867, gold was discovered in Gympie, leading to one of the wildest rushes in Queensland history. Soon, thousands of people would be travelling north in search of riches, and Cobb & Co coaches planned a service which was due to start in 1868. The coach routes would need stops at 12-mile stages, and the Griggers saw this as an opportunity. And they selected land on what was going to be the road from Brisbane to Gympie. William and Mary selected 160 acres of land, portion one, in the parish of Biowa. It was purchased in October 1868 for 20 pounds, including the survey fee. They moved their young family from Malula to their new home, a difficult journey through thick bushland. When they moved from Malula to here, when they took up the land and they moved, 
They took a day to ride from over at Mooloola. Mary had three little children and was pregnant with the fourth one. One was on the on the front of the horse with his father, one on the front of the horse with mother. The older boy strapped onto a pony and that took them from daylight till dark to get here. A homestead was quickly erected to be ready for the first coach run. They called it Bankford House, after Mary's home village in Scotland. It was the discovery of gold that uh, really was uh, the reason that Bankford House was established. In 1868, the first coach service uh, was started by Cobb & Co, and it, uh, it needed uh, lots of horse changing stations, it needed a lunch stop, it needed an overnight stop. So it was those uh, Scotsmen who were working uh, up in Mooloola deciding that um, Cobb & Co coach was probably the way they were going to make some money rather than go and look for gold themselves. While William continued to work away in the timber industry, Mary ran Bankford House. This red cedar table would be surrounded by the passengers along with their driver during a 40-minute lunch stop on the two-day journey to the Gimpy Goldfields. The Cobb & Co groomsmen who boarded at Bankford House would also change the five horses. Cobb & Co, um, they uh, really couldn't guarantee their timetable. And one of the things that uh, the coach driver used to do when uh, travelling up from Brisbane, which they left at half past four in the morning and didn't arrive uh, at Glasshouse until about midday, but that time was fairly elastic because you can imagine bringing a Cobb & Co coach up through the scrub, over, over creeks, through creek beds mostly because there were no bridges, they couldn't really guarantee their timing. So to give Mrs Grigger, who was preparing lunch for the passengers, uh, an indication of when the coach was going to arrive, the coach driver, he would blow a bugle about a half a mile down the road. And when Mrs Grigger, she heard that bugle, she would take the uh, meat out of the boiling pot and uh, get ready for lunch. Now, we don't have the menu, unfortunately, but we think it was boiled meat and potatoes. Cobb & Co would also deliver mail to Bankford House, which now served as the post office for the region. As Bankford House became more relied upon by travellers and the local community alike, Mary had to fulfil many diverse roles. And uh, she was also, uh, we understand, the midwife for the district. So many of those early pioneers, they would uh, bring their wives to Mary and she would care for them whilst they, uh, whilst they were at the later stage of their pregnancy, had the baby, and then the husband would be uh, away cutting timber or, or doing what he had to do, and he would come back and pick up his wife in a few weeks' time, for example. So she was going to be fairly busy. In fact, one of the things we've seen uh, in looking through the um, records of the old Kabulcha Divisional Board showed um, Mary, who was um, paid for extinguishing fires on bridges. So she was not only all of those other things, but she was a volunteer firefighter. Having to be resourceful, Mary also liked to pass on her skills to other pioneers. In 1870, she is credited in the Brisbane Courier, detailing how she preserved meat using bisulfite of lime. The bisulfite is mixed with the equal quantity of water and a small quantity of salt. Into the mixture the meat is put for a few minutes. It is then hung up and the mixture forming into a thin coating all over it. I'm not sure I would have been liking to eat too much of that meat. While business continued to roll into Bankford House, the years ahead would bring some turbulent times. In 1873, the Griggers family grew larger as Mary gave birth to son David who died shortly after of diphtheria. Son Robert was then born in 1875. This bunya tree was planted beside the house in 1878, when twins Margaret and Clementina were born. Sadly, Margaret passed away at only two months of age. In 1879, tragedy would again visit the Griggers, when Robert was bitten by a snake resulting in his death aged four. The three deceased children are all buried on the property. Despite their losses, Mary was resilient and with her family continued to run Bankford House, which would soon be full of different kinds of travellers.
In 1891, when the railway line between Brisbane and Gympie opened, it made the region accessible to the area's first tourists, keen to explore the nearby Glass House Mountains. That really was a, a turning point for those recreational climbers uh, coming up to Bankford House to stay, so they could climb uh, Tibragargan and Crookneck and Beowar and Gun Gun, all of those major peaks within the Glasshouse Mountains. The mail would also now arrive by rail, with William continuing as the official postmaster for the region. Great-grandfather Grigger used to go on his horse down to the railway each morning and each afternoon taking mail and, and picking it up again. In 1900, at the age of 66, Mary Grigger died, leaving William to carry on running Bankford House. William was then left as a widower and for a period of 12 months as a, an indication of a grieving period, he wore a black armband. Happier times followed in 1902 when youngest daughter Clementina married William Burgess, the son of the Grigger's nearest neighbours. William Burgess then moved into Bankford House, their bedroom, the very room Clementina was born in. William Grigger died in 1907, and Clementina became the heir to Bankford House, where she also took over as the official postmaster from 1907 to 1910 when the post office agency was transferred to the Glass Mountains Railway Station. Clementina Burgess died in 1963, and on her death, the ownership of the property changed hands to another generation of the family, becoming home to Clementina's daughter, Mary, and her husband, Jack Ferris. When my grandmother, Clementina Burgess, passed away, she left all the land to my uncle and he didn't want the house he said he didn't mind what happened to it so my mother who was very keen to live here as she was born here she and my dad bought the land and two acres of land and the house and when dad retired they came and they lived here and so they were the last people of the family to live in this house my dad lived here until he passed away and he was 101 and a half. Bankford House is the oldest surviving residence in its original location in the Glasshouse Mountains district. After Jack's passing, at the request of the family, the house was sold to council in 2004 for preservation. The Friends of Bankford House was formed as a volunteer group in 2006 to assist the council in achieving the vision of a house museum. Funding for the museum's development was provided from the Sunshine Coast Council Cultural Heritage Levy. Bankford House once welcomed Cobb & Co passengers, resting on their way to search for gold. Now, it serves as a reminder of times past, allowing us to step back in time for a peek at a different way of life, told in the very place where the Griggers accomplished so much. The items on display were collected through the years by the family. They each helped to tell the story of Mary Grigger and her descendants. They also tell the story of the Glasshouse Mountains and the challenges the settlers faced. Each object connected through time to the lives lived at Bankford House. I'm thrilled about it. I couldn't, I couldn't organise as, as much of our family history as is being preserved, I'm thrilled. I love the place and I hope everybody comes and sees it because they like it just like I liked it. In 2015, another chapter in the history of Bankford House began with the opening of a unique heritage interpretive conservation and workshop venue. It was given a name that honoured the very beginning of the Bankford House story, the Mary Grigger Centre.